Okay, we're at Craftsbury Outdoor Center. This is Larry Gluckman. It is Sunday, September 11th, 2016. I'm John Biglow, and I am, had the privilege of coaching with Larry this week. And before I leave, I wanted to get some of your story recorded. So I, I appreciate Thanks that, for John. giving me some time. I appreciate that. I know um, we chatted and, and said that you'd like to know a little bit about my history. Um, you can tell by my accent that I'm a New Yorker, and uh, I grew up uh, with lots of family around um, in Washington Heights, where my father's family uh, owned a very small store that sold uh, newspapers and cigarettes and stationery and magazines, and um, it was a store that was open from... Uh, five o'clock in the morning till one o'clock at night uh, in the, uh, the next day. And three brothers helped run the store. And uh, that was my probably my first example of uh, teamwork and dedication uh, that these three brothers put into the store so that three families um, could exist. And uh, it only when it got to the point where the landlord who was renting the space um, began to want to force them out that they have to dissolve the business and move out and do different things. At that point, my parents moved out to uh, Hampton Bays, which is a, a bedroom community for South Hampton, East Hampton, West Hampton. And um, um, I went to school there. I uh, loved being in a small town, uh, being part of a, a community that uh, um, was literally blue collar, fishermen, clamors, carpenters, people that serviced other people. And uh, I had a wonderful high school career in, in terms academically and very small public high school, 32 kids in the graduating class. And I um, enjoyed all sports, but I'd never rowed before, but I was surrounded by water and loved being on the water. Um, and then I uh, was fortunate enough to go to Northeastern. Uh, I was the first in my family, um, immediate family, to go to college. My mom went to business school. My father never graduated, fought five years in the Second World War. And uh, none of my uncles went to college, so uh, my father's brothers. And so I, um, I felt really um, pretty obligated to be successful in college. And, and both my parents encouraged me to be in athletics as a high school kid, and I thought that I needed to carry that. And I tried different sports at Northeastern, where freshmen, when I went to school, um, were able to have their own team. They were a freshman football team and a freshman basketball. And so I thought I could do it. I was a pretty good athlete, and I didn't stand a chance in making any of those teams. And a boy on the floor where I, was going, where I had a dormitory room suggested I try rowing. I did, and I had the privilege of rowing for a guy named Ernie Arlette. And Ernie started the program in the summer of 1964 and I joined in um, October, November 1964 and by May of 1965, eight months later, uh, Northeastern swept the Dad Vale. They won the freshman, the JV, and the varsity, essentially with all freshman crews or all novice crews, none of the guys in the program had ever rowed before. And so even though they might have been a sophomore or a junior or a senior, they learned their rowing from Ernie. And Ernie coached um, three or four crews at a time. There was no, he had no assistant. And uh, he basically molded this group of guys, trained them during the winter, raced them in the spring, won the Dad Vale, and before the program was a year old, he rode at um, Henley. And where were you in the cruise? Uh, I was in the nth 
freshman crew. There wasn't, some days we never even got outdoors because we didn't have enough coxswains or Ernie didn't want to take the risk in putting us out there and not having a coach. Um, I did, at the beginning of my sophomore year, um, I was coached by a fellow named Dick Hirsch, who actually was a president, was the president of Hobart Smith, and also hired me to be the rowing coach at Trinity College. He was the president there. So, any case, um, Dick Hirsch was also one of the first coxswains to cox an, N an NRF European crew. Um, in the 60s, late 60s, there were crews that went abroad under the uh, NAAO banner sponsored by the NRF, National Rowing Foundation. Um, so in any case, <clears throat> I joined the crew uh, as a freshman. I rowed as a, as a sophomore, rowed in the first head of the Charles in October 1965 that Ernie Arlette helped start with Cambridge Boat Club. And by spring of 1966, I made the varsity. And I rode in the varsity for three years, 66, 67, 68. And in 67, I was a Vesper rower. I rode during the summer at Vesper. And we went to the European Championships, and I won a medal in the four. So I had been rowing two years, and uh, I was fortunate enough to row with a very experienced group of guys, and we won a medal. The coach was Dietrich Rose at that point. This was 64? 67. 67. 67, yeah. So I started in October of 1964, and by... August of 1967, I had already rode at my first Fisa regatta. So that was that was that showed me what what hard work and determination, and listening to the coach, and just making rowing a priority could do. What seat did you row? I rode two seat in the four. And who else was in there? A guy named Bob Brayton. Um, at one point, Hugh Foley who um, was a 1964 Olympian in the men's eight that Vesper built. There was a guy named Bob Brayton, um, a star out of the Dartmouth rowing program of that era, and a guy uh, named Lee Demarest came out of, um, I believe he came out of Cornell. And for a while, uh, there was a guy named Sean Shea, who went to St. Joe's, rode at Vespa quite a while, and he was in the bow of the boat until he had to do something for the Navy, and he had to leave. So, and Foley took his spot. And, and how was the race for you? Uh, the, the race for us was pretty much, Dietrich knew so many people in Europe. He actually said, I don't think you could win, but you can win a silver or a bronze medal if you keep your heads. And um, he was right. We uh, we kind of worked it all the way down the course, and then he has a race plan, which we incorporated, and which a lot I used a lot, and that is, and I don't know if it would work now, but people employ something like it. It's um, just to be in contact with the leader. Do whatever it takes to be in, just in contact, five feet of wall open or whatever, and it, he says, until 1,300 meters, Take a 20, takes you to almost 1,500 meters, and then go. And just, you know, know it's going to be 55, 60 strokes, and just put your head down and just go to the finish line. And we were riding between third and fourth a lot at that point, and we went, and uh, we ended up um, coming in third, which was pretty exciting. And uh, then I came back, and Ernie, in his way, this is September, October, 1967, Larry, I want you to take a break. Why don't you learn how to skull? And I, uh, I said, sure, coach, I'd love to learn how to skull. He said, well, here's a boat, here's your oars, you're an international oarsman, 
I'll help you carry it down. I pushed off the dock and I immediately flipped over. And we were rowing at Riverside and I got there a little bit early because I didn't want to interfere with the eights. And all the guys were warming up and there's a, a balcony at Riverside. And they were all kind of standing there watching Ernie and I at the dock with this single. And I flipped going away from the dock had to swim under the boat, and now the boat is, is behind me, and the dock is in front of me, and I'm trying to crawl back up onto the dock. And Ernie, I know he was smiling, because, you know, it was sort of, yeah, you think you're a big international oarsman, and you don't know shit about, about sculling. And, uh, and, and that was a good... That put me in my place. Ernie was a sculler, right? Ernie sculled. Ernie coached sculling. His favorite sport was boxing. His ears were, were, back, were pinched in from boxing, and his hands were huge, huge hands. And his brother and father, George Arlett, Ernie is Ernest George Arlett, and his brother is Harry Arlett, and George is his father, they coached um, uh, Jack Kelly, and um, and they have always been involved in the Kelly family. So when you had a chance to be part of that um, his history, Ernie was born in Henley on Thames, and they had a home someplace in Henley, and they rode out of. Um, I believe it was Henley Rowing Club, down the river a ways from Leander. So Ernie went ahead and he creates this crew at Northeastern that in less than a year, they, this university decides to send them to Henley. And the, um, the first Saturday is the 4th of July and they celebrated Ernie's birthday at Henley with this crew. They won one race in the Thames Cup and they lost the second race. So that was, that was pretty good. The, <clears throat> Ernie, Ernie was a significant athletic influence on my life. Um, he was all about business. His word, you know, was the law. But Ernie started coaching, as I mentioned, Northeastern in, in 19... Fall of 1964, summer 1964. Eight years later, he won the sprints twice, 72 and 73. And in each year, he rode in the final of the Grand with that crew against the Russians and uh, overlapped them in the final. Uh, and in 73, he took a bunch of alumni and took him over and we won the Prince Philip. So whatever he was doing during that eight or nine year period, um, he really had an impact on the sport. Some of his best athletes were Jimmy Dietz, Calvin Coffey, myself, um, were guys, a guy named Vic Pazinski that um, rode on uh, a uh, Pan American team. Um, so there were, there were some people that he had a huge, huge impact on. Um, when I graduated, uh, I, in Northeastern's five years, you can row your first four. Um, in my fifth year, he asked me if I would be interested in coaching guys that the freshman coach and he didn't have time to coach. So sometimes it was a mixture of second freshman, third varsity, third freshman, whatever they had available, I would, I would take out in the afternoons. And uh, I really found that to be really stimulating and fun. And I had a chance to act like a coach, and even though I was still a student. Um, and then I heard that uh, uh, there was a possible opening coaching at Columbia. And um, I was interested in getting 
um, a special ed degree uh, because I was always interested in adaptive education for people who and kids who had physical issues. Where do you think that came from? That's a really good question. And I think it came from the fact that I, I didn't know how to row. And somebody taught me how to make that motion. And the emotion of learning to do something so foreign from anything you've ever done is not that much different than teaching somebody how to hold a fork or a spoon and being able to take soup out of a bowl or ice cream out of a bowl. And I just thought that I could give back um, because I felt I had a, a, a wonderful education and I really enjoyed working with those physical problems with people. And, and so in any case, I got a master's at Teachers College of Columbia. And at the same time, I was uh, what nowadays they would call uh, a, a graduate assistant coach. At that time, for $6,000 a year, uh, the NAAO deemed me a professional. I was a professional um, in, in rowing. And when I went back to row again, when I finished my master's, my wife and I, I was married in 1971 to Sarah Griffin. Um, I, I asked her if, I would, if she would consider allowing me to spend the next year preparing to see if I could make the 72 Olympic team. And um, Harry was the coach of that team. And uh, so uh, we moved up there in um, August of 71. And my wife and I were employed by Boston Public Schools. She at Hyde Park and me at the Copley Square High School which doesn't exist anymore, but it was sort of a special school. They wanted to have a, a work and study environment where the kids went to school in the morning and then they went out to a job in the afternoon. Just to get the experience about what it was to be a retailer, what it was to be a um, carpenter or a plumber, the manual arts, what it was to uh, work in an office. So kids could go, I know what I don't want to do. And um, so I would go row in the morning in a small boat. And then uh, on weekends, um, Harry was rowing out of Union, the Union Boat Club. Uh, and guys would congregate there. And um, midway through the winter, when we were training, uh, Harry suggested that I would clear, clear up any issue about receiving money to coach. That he was afraid that somebody in the United States, should I be selected to be on the team, would raise a red flag saying, well, wait a minute. Even though Gluckman was a student at Columbia, he received some money to, uh, to be a coach. It was basically 500 bucks a month. And um, that was my stipend or salary. I, whatever you want to call it. But, and so you, at that point, it was NAAO. They, um, they had a series of meetings that I wasn't at. And then finally, they, they said, we're going to have a meeting, and you're going to be at it. And you could bring anybody you want to help support your case, because we're beginning to lean against you because you did receive money for coaching, regardless of whether it was a stipend or a salary or whatever. And I remember the meeting, it was in um, the New York AC, and I, I invited Bill Stowe, who was my boss, to kind of explain my situation with me being a graduate student and working only part-time um, with the crew program, and yes, I did receive a stipend, and Bill, Bill uh, sat down next to me, and he, um, he explained exactly what my status was. And then he, he final, his final statement was, for the last year, I had a chance to watch Larry's cruise. And I can assure you, he's not a professional coach. And 
and everybody laughed, but that was his point, really, that in order to call me a professional, there had to be a, a standard that had to be met. And really, I, I, you know, it's one thing to coach the second and third boats of somebody's program, but to coach the first boat of the freshman program or whatever bill passed down to me, it's a lot different in terms of responsibility. And uh, it got a chuckle out of everybody, but it didn't um, seem to deter them, and they prevented me from going to trial or to be part of the 72 camp. And um, I was probably the first and the last athlete that that happened to in rowing. Um, as soon as the Olympics were over, I got a letter from NAAO welcoming back as, as an amateur oarsman. That they said that, that um, in conference with FISA, they brought up several examples of athletes who were, you know, soldiers. There were a couple of American athletes who were in the military and their only assignment was to show up at a boathouse. And um, the 1964-8 had five or six of the guys in it. And uh, I said, well, I'm, I'm not part of the military, but I was a graduate student. As soon as I got my master's, I was out. Almost makes you take it personally, dude. Uh, I, I took it personally um, only for a little bit. I, I understood where they were coming from, but the timing of it was the timing. And, and as far as I was concerned, it never occurred to me until it got brought up. And I was moving on. I, you know, I, I, I had rode. I had, you know, rode a little bit at Columbia um, with actually some of the athletes. We would, we would row in the morning, and we would... Um, uh, I became very friendly um, with a, a guy named Mitch Brody, and myself, Mitch Brody, and Dick Roseman in 1969 uh, w were the uh, U.S. Maccabea pair with. And we went to Israel and we rode. And um, it didn't seem to be much of an issue that I was going to Columbia to coach the freshmen in September of 69, no one raised a flag at that point. So it never occurred to me that earning $500 a month as, a, as a, uh, what I deemed at that point a graduate assistant, U.S. Rowing or NAAO deemed it as a professional coach. And how old were you in 72? Uh, in 72, I was, let's see, 46. I was 26. So did you think so then I skipped over 72 and my good friend this guy Vic Brzezinski in the, in the uh, summer of 72 we both decided that we were going to maybe row the pair in 73 as soon as the Olympics were over I knew I could row so he and I were both in Boston and uh we started rowing the pair, and then when school started, Ernie Arlett said, you know, I'm really interested in putting two boats together to go to Henley. Should we win the Eastern Sprints again, the varsity will go, and I'd like to take an alumni boat. Um, Ernie was also thinking that he could get enough alumni in the area that he could put, produce a crew that could be competitive against his varsity. He wanted a lot of Northeastern alums to come back to the boathouse and elevate the program by r rowing with the varsity, not in the same boats, obviously, but against them periodically. And, and we did uh, at various occasions. But mostly, and Bill Miller was in that boat, um, mostly it was it was an opportunity for alumni to get back into rowing again, and they created the Northeastern University Rowing Association, which almost every major program has, some sort of alumni association. Well, sure enough, the varsity wins the sprints again in 1973, 
and we have this four. We go with Ernie to Henley, and um, bingo, we end up winning the four at Henley. Okay, and Prince Philip. the Phillips, Prince Phillips, and Ernie's eight again races the Russians in the Grand, and comes up, comes up shy. Um, and so that summer, the summer of 73, Steve Gladstone is the head coach for the national team. And he um, invites some of the guys out of the four to the national team selection camp after the Harvard-Yale race. And we go to Hanover. First to Princeton and then to Hanover. And lo and behold, Bill Miller and myself and Calvin Coffey, three Northeastern guys, end up making the eight. And um, we go to Moscow, we race in Moscow, we win, we win the, either the semi or the heat, I can't remember, and we draw a, um, uh, we, we draw a rough lane. Uh, it's, it's the first year that Kolba is racing as a senior level. He had won the juniors and all of that, and now he draws lane one, and he wins going away. And we draw lane five in the eight, and unbeknownst to us, there seems to be a variation in, in the lanes, and they don't juggle them like they do now, where if you win the semi and it's a crosswind, the winners of the semi get to be right next to each other in the lead of the win, pretty much. That, that didn't happen then. We rode really hard, um, but we came in fifth. Dietrich Rose, at that point, comes to us and says, look, I think you guys are better than you showed. Let's go to Eberbach and Heidelberg, and we'll race for the Martini Opta. And in 1973, Martini and Rossi, Empaka and Carlish all came together and said, we're going to host this regatta, and we're going to invite the, the six finalists from Moscow in the eight and, um, to come to uh, Heidelberg and race, one and done. Just line it up, no heats, no reps, no nothing, six crews, get to the start, and go. And some crews thought that was a great idea, and some crews said, no, we're not going to do it. So they filled in with other combinations, and the Norwegians put an all-sculling eight together. Their quad, their single, their double, and their men's spare. Do you remember how they did in the eights in Moscow? Uh, I don't know. How, well, Norway didn't have an eight okay. uh, at, at the Worlds, okay? So on the very last day when this is all being organized, we're, we're shy one guy. And we can't get another American to row. And we go to a fellow named Hugh Matheson, pen rower. And we say, Hugh, you go to school in the United States. You're almost American. Do you want to come and row with us at this regatta? The U.S. was fifth at the regatta, so we had a spot in the race. And we had four or five of the guys from the eight in the boat, including the coxswain, which was uh, Paul Hoffman, which was in the video, mm -hmm. and Al Shea. Uh, no, Shealy was one of the guys we missed. He had to get back to, to get back to Harvard. So, in any case, Matheson um, agrees to row with us. We end up winning, and we cross the line, and we're sitting there, and um, the Brits come by. They were third or fourth, and. They look over and they cheer and they go, well done, USA, and God bless the Queen, because they all knew Matheson. Matheson was on the national team for, Can for Great Britain, but he didn't get selected to row with them at, in Heidelberg. 
<laughs> so he joined us. And no one gave a crap. I mean, that was the wonderful thing about that regatta. Everybody was looking to have a good time. But the winner got an Empaker 8, a wooden Empaker 8 called the Martini Octa. And in 1974, Al Rosenberg, with Al Shealy and Dick Cashin in the boat, created an eight that won the world championships in Lucerne, rowing the Martini Octa, of which Mike Vespoli was part of that crew. And they tried to do it again in 1975, and they tried to do it again at the Olympics. And each time, the crew got a little bit less and a little bit less effective. Until 1976, when Al ran a camp to select the Olympic eight and a four that was supposed to go to trial, and there was a mutiny at the camp. And um, three of the guys who were in the eight when they won the world championships, left camp. Vespoli, Tim Mickelson, and Ken Brown. I was at camp then, and that he only had um, 12 guys at camp. And from the 12 guys, he was gonna create the eight and the four. And um, he couldn't make a decision. It's coming up to Memorial Day of uh, being two months away from the Olympics, basically. And um, Vespoli says to Rosenberg, uh, Al, you've got to make a decision. We have gone through every permutation of seat racing. We have done physiological testing. While we're in Wisconsin, we did physiological and we did psychological testing to see when our... Um, best, you know, were the, like not, not a horoscope, but it was, it was called some biorhythms. It was when our biorhythm was at the highest level. And, um, and we did the uh, MMPI, which is a psychological index. And um, all that information was being handled by a guy who was a professor at um, uh, a sports psychologist at the uh, University of Wisconsin. He said, I won't give you that information until after the Olympics, since I don't, I don't know how the information impacts rowers. I've got the information, I'll share it to you afterward. Um, after the, those three guys left, uh, left the camp, in Han the camp was in Hanover, uh, Al had nine guys in camp. And he said, well, we have four ports and five starbits. We're going to have to drop a starbit. And he selected myself and a fellow named Chip Lupson. I don't know if that name rings a bell. Okay. And Chip. And we went out and we did some single boat seat racing on two different parts of the, of the Connecticut River. And, Ra and uh, Al uh, Rosenberg, based on those results, indicated that I got beat and that I was to leave camp by 5 o'clock that afternoon. And along with me was Bob Jockstetter, the coxswain. He said, there's no reason to have two coxswains here. We don't have a four with, and we don't, we don't need an extra coxswain. Um, Dave Weinberg was his coxswain. And um, um, so Jock Stetter and I hooked up with Mickelson, Vespoli, and Brown. And um, we went to trial and came in second to the Borschel Four. And that was the end of, right then, it was, the race was in Princeton. I was done. I went home to see my wife. She was staying with my parents out in Hampton Bays. And uh, it was a morning race. I remember that. I drove out three hours to, um, to Hampton Bays. At 9 o'clock at night, I get a phone call from Al. And he says, the guys voted, and they want you to be the starboard spare. 
to the eight. Do you want to do it? I go, well, I'll have to call you back. And I called the other four guys up. And I said, Al wants me to be the spare. And um, I won't do it if you don't think I should do it. We are, a, we are a team. We are loyal to each other. You guys got screwed. I don't know if I got screwed or not on that seat racing. But in any case, I'm committed to you. And if you say, don't do it, I'm done. He needed a port spare too, didn't he? Yeah. Robert Espeset, the young kid out of Wisconsin. This was his first national team. Okay, Bob Espeset never lost the IRA. Won the freshman, the JV, and twice as a, a, a varsity athlete. Never lost the IRA from 1973 to 1976. And then he went on to an illustrious career at Penn AC in Vesper, where he won several, won several um, medals. Uh, both in uh, four withouts and four with very successful laws and a, a wonderful coach down at Chattanooga, University of Chattanooga. So in any case, um, the guys say, no, if you go and you, you're needed, we want, we want you to be the spare if, of anybody. We want you to row for us in that age. Our, our spirit, our our feeling about being part of the Olympics will be vicariously through you. Now, no one, no one on the starboard side got ill. On the port side, Al Sheely came down with mono. And Al refused to take him out of the boat. And they didn't do well in the heat. They didn't do well in the rep, and they missed the final. Who does he have in the boat? But he has the stroke of the Washington 8 in the boat, a guy named Mike Hess. Um, and he didn't want to put, he didn't want to take out uh, Al and put Mike in. Espy was the sixth man of the, of the Wisconsin crew. He'd been there for two years. He could have jumped into six and been right at home, big kid, strong kid, you know, a little bit goofy, a little bit crazy, but his heart was all about making the oar bend. And Al chose not to do that. And um, it was hard. It was hard on Al Rosenberg, uh, hard on Al Rosenberg, harder on Sheely, and not a good decision for the crew. Um, and so, with, with that result, my Olympics was over by the rep because they were not, since Al wasn't going to make any changes and no starboard side was ill, um, I wasn't going to get in for the B final or anything like that. And um, so I was all done. And I actually, at that point, came up here. The very first time I came to, um, to Northeast uh, Vermont and we my wife and I rented a little house on the lake that I now have my home on and We stayed there in 1976. You would have been 30. I was exactly 30. Thank you um, I was 30 the Olympics were over um, In late August we came up here and I, I can't remember whether I celebrated my birthday or not uh, but at that point, I was at Wisconsin getting a degree. A, um, I was going to get a PhD in, in um, uh, exercise physiology with the idea that my dissertation was going to be on a, um, an interesting point. I've, oh, I had felt that some of the reasons why kids and young adults did not see improvement in rehab in some cases was because they lacked fitness. A, a, a basic fitness that kids who can be kids go out and get when they run around, ride their bikes, go swimming, do a lot of things 
So yeah, if they get banged up or if they break a leg or whatever the case is, they've got this residual fitness. Kids who have different types of handicaps, their cardiovascular fitness and their recoverability to stress um, is impeded because of the lack of fitness. And I wanted to document that. I thought that if we could have kids of common ages, kids with disabilities and, and getting training, and kids with disabilities just doing what kids with disabilities normally do, when, when some sort of application of therapy was applied, the kids with fitness would see better results. They would be able to do more therapy because they could recover quicker. Well, lo and behold, I finished all my coursework. Wisconsin was one of the few programs in the United States, University of Wisconsin Graduate School, that in between the time that I rode in Moscow and came back to row in the Olympics, I, I was in the Peace Corps with my wife. And um, we were there from the end of 1973 through April of 1975. And uh, the reason it was April 75 is because uh, Al Rosenberg wrote me a note and said, Larry, um, we really want to give you a chance to make the eight for 75 and potentially for 76. And since I didn't make the team in 68, and since I didn't make the team in 72, I saw this as my last chance. And what did you do in the Peace Corps? That's a lot of time. Uh, yeah. Um, we were, my, my wife was a public educator, and I was a special education teacher. Where? So we went to Brazil, coincidentally. We went to Brazil, and she started working as a health educator, um, working for various groups that were providing uh, health instruction to people who lived in the interior of Brazil. And so we, we went to different spots, but we ultimately spend the most time in the northeast portion of Brazil. And uh, it's um, where Salvador and Bahia, and then uh, Recife, Aracaju, uh, all along the coast. And when they say interior, what they mean is it's away from the capital. Because the most capital cities have regular roads and everything else. You can come five or six miles out of some of those capitals and you're on dirt roads like this and there's no electricity. So we, I worked for this uh, Secretary of Education helping women who uh, wanted to be like para, para educators in the field of special education. My, Sarah worked for the Secretary of Health and she would get picked up every morning by a Jeep. We were living near the beach in Alakaju and um, uh, she'd get picked up and she would go into these small villages and talk about when you're digging a well, you don't dig the well below where your sewage is, okay? Or if in fact you go to the stream to get water, you need to put the purification tablets in. You need to run, run the water through a filter because what was happening was mothers were getting sick like diarrhea. They would then breastfeed. The baby would pick up the germ from the from the milk, and then the baby would get diarrhea. And babies were malnutrition, they were dehydrated, they were everything that you as a doctor probably know that. And um, so her goal was just to help pregnant women and women who just gave birth to have them be more um, alert about that. And she had, I mean, they couldn't do enough for her personal driver, personal translator, although my wife spoke good Portuguese. I mean, they, they, she really hit, hit the home run. And she gave up a lot so that I could try to make that Olympic team. Because she, as far as she was concerned, she could have lived in Brazil forever. It was 
where we were living and what we were doing was wonderful. But I had this burn in me um, that I, I needed to know that I was not capable of being an Olympic athlete. Were you staying in shape? Oh, I was crazy. Crazy shape. I, I would, there was a sand dune that was about, because we were living on the beach, right off the beach in, in Brazil. There was a sand dune that was probably, you know, I would say 50 yards, 60 yards high in very soft sand. And once or twice a week, I would run a hundred of those. That was my stadium. I would run four or five miles in a calf high water. I would do, I created these sandbag weights. I created cement weights. I had the Canadian Air Force training program for their um, um, sort of their beret guys, you know, their green beret guys. and. Um, and they had an hour program that kept your heart rate at about 160 for an hour. And I rode about four times in Brazil at various little clubs. I'd just go at around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, walk in and say, I'm an American. I row. Can I jump in a boat with one of you guys? Four times over two years. Over, yeah, a year and 18, yeah, 18, 19 months. Yeah, exactly. And um, it was just to keep keep feel, but other than that, um, that's all I did. And so I came back and Tony Johnson was the assistant coach at that time. And he ran a Fours camp for guys that got cut from the eight in 1975, cut from Al Rosenberg's eight. And I made the four. By July, I arrived home in, in August, and I had made the, eight, uh, the four by July. Tiff Wood, um, Tiff Wood, Fellows, and um, Tiff Wood, Fellows, and Brooks, Tony Brooks. That was the crew. Uh, Brooks stroking. Tiffin Bow and Fellows and me in a bucket at three four uh, at two three. And that was the four. We came in eighth or ninth. Straight four. Four with, I think it was Jock Stetter again was the coxswain. And you got eighth or ninth. Eighth or ninth, yeah. And then, and then I went back to graduate school after that, and Sarah had us all set up in a, in a graduate housing. And uh, over two years, 75, and uh, by the summer of 77, uh, I had finished all my coursework. Ernie retired in 77. Buzz Congram took the Northeastern job. Buzz calls me up and says, Larry, could you become my assistant? I need, to, I need somebody who understands Boston. I need somebody who understands... Northeastern, and at that point, I went to my advisor, and I said, you know, I, I'd like to help out my alma mater. I'll do it for a year, and then I'll come back, make my proposal, and um, I'll finish my degree. And where are you thinking about your own competing? I'm all done by then, 76. And how did you resolve that? How did you make uh, I resolved that? it by saying I, I have to move on. You know, it's not in the cards. I had three opportunities to make the Olympic team, and I, um, I didn't do it, so let's, let's, let's move on. The most interesting thing that happened to me during that era was how um, coaches and athletic administrators impacted athletes' lives. And to this day, that is the number one concern I have as a coach, that I do no harm, that, that I make sure that the decisions I make are well-founded, that can be, dis can be explained to the athlete, that it's in the athletes. I, I said to my athletes, no matter where I went, if you, allow, if, if you have the opportunity to resolve a situation by being fitter, stronger, technically better, and tougher, 
and you can demonstrate it, then take the decision out of my hands because I hate making those decisions. If you make it easy for me to have somebody beat you, then you have to go with the consequences. Okay? I hate making a decision that is ambiguous, that can be questioned, and, um, and so I think that impacted my coaching career. So as a coach, how did you, what, what methods did you use to... I, I made sure that, 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 you know, to a certain extent, I would create um, benchmarks, and the kids who became closest to the benchmarks would then be considered for spots in whatever crews we were developing. A benchmark such as? A, a, a physi what I would do is I would create composite fitness parameters. I would take an ergometer. I would take a, um, a, a weightlifting circuit. I would take a two-mile run. I called it a composite, like a combine. And I would take all these things and I would, it didn't make a difference how big you are, how small you are. Um, in some cases, I would divide um, max amount of weight divided by body weight. So somebody who's lighter that can lift a lot of weight in a certain amount of time, they would, they would rise up. A big guy who could lift a lot of weight, but it took him longer to do it because he wasn't that fit, it would cost him a little bit. In any case, I would create these criteria, and I would say the top eight on each side, port, port and starboard, would be considered for the varsity eight. And then I'm going to look at your rowing ability. So I take, I take and I match the top four ports on each side, or the top four ports again, and the top four starboards, and I race them off, and I come up with two ports and two starboards that are uh, the bottom, and I'd race the next four ports and starboards, and I'd get the top two, and I'd race them against the bottom. So sea so, racing, sea racing's your... Sea racing was the beginning of it, and then when it got close, I put them into the eight and see who made the eight go faster. But you first had to be fit, because personally, you stand next to me, or you stand next to Dick, I stand next to Dick Cashin, or I stand next to Dick Dreisiacker, and there's four or five inches, because I'm six foot. I had to be fitter and technically better than the big guys, because I didn't have the reach, I, you know, I didn't have the easy flow of matching with, with, with tall guys, and so that became my modus operandi, and that's what I imply, and that gave kids who didn't see themselves because they weren't typical, prototypical rowers, didn't see themselves as, as those kids who are gonna easily make the boat, said, I can do that. I, I am, I control my destiny. And I, I just thought that, that that was the one thing that kids could count on. I set what the criteria was, I helped them train, you know, I do whatever I had to do, but at the end of the day, they had to perform. And then I would just list, I'd list every result. There was never any hedging or anything. As soon as we come off the water after seat racing, and I always do seat racing two ways. I do distance and time. So time, was four minutes. Distance was 1,000 meters or 800 meters. I would just decide a distance. And I'd mark it out. And I would say, you're going to get time from here to here by the watch. And, and if it's a lot of distance or margin between the crews, I might end the piece here. But this might be three minutes and 15 seconds. No piece will exceed four minutes. But between 3.15 and 4 minutes, you can make up. If you're at a deficit at 3, if you change that around, you're awarded the piece. Even though from here to here, you might, your opponent might have had a faster time, when I say go to 4 minutes and you could win the piece, 
that showed me your heart. That didn't get you down, that you were down at 800. You figure out a way in the next 45 seconds to change the complexion of the piece. You do that enough, and kid goes, oh, you don't have a length on us with 300 to go? I'm smiling. I'm going to do this. And you constantly build that. And all of a sudden, kids go, there's, I only, there's only one last stroke. I'm going to take it. And that's the way I went to every program, and it was the same thing. I've got, I've got, you remember Sarah last night said, you know, very systematic, everything was on a spreadsheet. I've got spreadsheets out there, yin-yang, with results on it. You look at it now and you go, how did I ever spend time typing those numbers in and everything? But you know what? That was the ticket. I could give that to a kid, and the kid go, oh, shit, I'm fifth on starboard. Yeah. I'm going to go down that tank. I'm going to spend an hour in the tank to make sure my, my entry and my release is perfect. Because I've got the fitness to be a varsity athlete. You went to great lengths to be fair. Fair. And transparent. Because I didn't feel that along the process for me, people, coaches treated me fairly. But you have no recourse. You're 22 years old. Coach has been in the game for 20 years. Really? Are you going to go to the U.S. Rowing or NAAO and say, I don't think he's, he treated me fairly? And that, that's not going to happen. Your rowers were generally satisfied. Yeah, yeah, all but one. All but one. And a seat grace result. For this one boy, for this one boy, I know we're getting a little bit off, but th it, this is an important piece. For this one boy, he was captain of the crew at Trinity and he was part of the crew that won the first head of the Charles that Trinity had ever won uh, it was it's the collegiate event he was in that crew uh, he was a senior he'd been in the program four years and after we won that race we made a commitment to go if we if we were in the top two at the ECAC regatta, which was the championship regatta, um, if we were in the top two, we would consider going to Henley. We made that commitment. Asked the parents, asked the school, I wrote everything up, told them what the criteria was. And um, in the middle of the winter, the father of this boy who was the captain said to me, I'd love to see you go to the San Diego Crew Classic. I, I think that would be a great regatta for you to prepare for the championship. A lot of racing. We rode a couple of different events, and we won all the events we were in. Cal Cup, um, the Senior Eight. We won a couple of events at, at, at uh, Crew Classic. Come back, have a good season, and miss winning ECAC by a half a second. And, but I'm committed to going because I think we've had a great year. Second year at Trinity. And um, I said that um, my philosophy was as long as we kept winning, there would be no changes in the crew. Whatever crew I decided on at the beginning of the year, if you kept winning, the crew stayed the same. I, I might have flipped seats or whatever, crew stayed the same. Well, we were undefeated going into ECAC we lose. That opens the door. And I, through the process of elimination, come up with the captain as being vulnerable. And I seat raced him against the best freshman in, in, in our program, who is a kid out of the Haverford School who was on a, a, a high school national sculling quad from Haverford, won the quad for Haverford. Big kid, name is Jody Coffin. And, and I go to the captain. I said, you've been captain. You've been honorable and you've been dedicated to this program. You, I'm going to seat race you tomorrow. I haven't selected the crews. You tell me what, besides yourself and Jody, tell me what are the six guys you want to seat race with. I want you to feel that this is absolutely the fairest seat race 
you can have. And he told me the six guys. I made up the lineups. I seat raced them. Coffin won. We did switch, switch back. So we had a result. We switched, had a result. Oh, the six guys he chose were the other guys in the boat. Other guys that were going to be in the eight. Guys he trusted. Wait, t you did it in fours or eight? Fours. Yeah. Did it in fours. And the reason I did it in fours was because I wanted to find out who had the power. Because we still had, you know, you finish racing in mid-May. You have seven weeks before Henley. And we were going to have to race the likes of whoever won the lightweight national championship. We're going to have to race the people who came in uh, because lady plate, what the ladies plate wasn't available. They, um, uh, you would race the best JVs in the country because the varsities were now fin filling the ladies plates event, right? Um, we were going to have to race the best freshman crew in the country. So I needed somebody, knowing Henley, I needed somebody to get us into the thick of things early and not have us have to make up a huge deficit. And, um, and so I thought by doing it in fours, capping the rate no higher than 34, but no lower than 32, I could learn something about that. And so we did the, you know, we, result, switch, switch back. And Jordy won every piece. The captain, we come into the dock. While the boat is pulling into the dock, while the, the four is pulling into the dock, captain stands up, steps out of the boat, walks right out of the boathouse. Everybody's upset. I said, don't worry about it. If, if it were me, I would be upset too. Just think. Just think what's going on in this kid's head. Not only is he disappointed, not only is he not going to be in the eight, but his whole career now is measured by a seat race against a freshman. Even though it's a very high caliber freshman, at least in Division Three, he has lost. And it's even harder because he's captain. Captain. I said, so everybody take a deep breath. Here are the results. Everybody can see. I have the coxswains write down after every single piece what their time was to the time, you know, to the distance mark and what they perceived the margin being to the four minute mark. So that there were three different people collecting this data. So I call them up, I call the captain up and I said, okay, let's talk about what happened this afternoon. And, you know, it wasn't fair. I got put into the lesser boat in the beginning. I said, look, are you comfortable with those six guys you picked? He goes, yes. I said, well, then you can figure the fours. You tell me who should, maybe I didn't do it right. You tell me who should be in each of the fours. And so he made some changes. And I said, well, we'll run it tomorrow. It was only three pieces, 12 minutes of rowing at 34. We can do this. You know, it was 10 minutes between four minute pieces. You know, you change guys, you have to paddle back. We always did it in the same direction. And I said, you're capable of doing that. And I said, how does that sound? Would that be fair? Said, well, I don't think I should be selected at all to have to do this, but be that as it may, this is the way I would l line the, the fours up. I said, done. We go out the next day. Everybody knows what's at stake. I remind them about who these people are, even to the point of, you know, do you have allegiance to Jordy? He's only a freshman versus, versus the captain who's been here with you guys and everything. I mean, I'm trying to be, and, and the two kids that are racing right there, and uh, they... Um, Guys go, we totally get it, coach. We're going to row as hard as we can on how many pieces. You want to keep flipping? You want to do the same piece over again? We're, we're there, coach. Peter Graves is part of that group. 
Tom Graves is part. You can't get two more honest pullers that I've ever had in college rowing. They're both in one of the two fours. And um, we run it again, Jordy wins again. So now Jordy has won six pieces. Two different sets of lineups, it's pretty obvious. So, the cap, so I say to the captain, look, we want you with us. You will be the port spare. Your partner, Ed Slater, you and him will row a double. And you'll be the spares. We'll, we'll drop the double at, at any point in the preparation. If somebody comes up lame and they are deemed that they can't row, we'll drop them. We'll drop that person and either one of you will move into the eight. They both agree to do that. They both agree that's fair. They don't like it, but, they're, but they'll do it. We go through training and we end up scrimmaging Yale um, a week or 10 days before they go to the IRA. Yale beats us, Yale wins the national championship. Yale Lightweights. What year is this? This is uh, 2005. Andy wins the national championship. Cal wins the freshman eight by two lengths open water. They, no crew has been overlapped with the Cal freshman all year long. They row a faster time than the Cal JV who wins the national championship. Okay? Um, but only the Cal freshmen go to Henley uh, because St uh, it was Steve said, well, the Cal JV would get beat by the Cal freshmen, so let's just send the Cal freshmen. Doesn't make sense to send the, the second fastest crew. We'll send the first fastest crew. Makes total sense. They had on the ladder, Yale was at the top of one ladder, and Cal was at the top of the other ladder, and um, we were seventh in the Cal ladder, the seventh seed. Um, and we end up facing Cal on Friday at, at Henley. And um, we beat him by a half a deck. We went for the lead. Only as, only as um, Peter Graves can do. We went for the lead, of which I find out after the fact, because I, that's the other thing, John. I have never done a race plan in my life. I have let the crew do the race plan. They write it out, they talk about it, and then before they shove, they hand me the plan. This is the way we're going to go at it, coach. I go, well, there's enough hard strokes in here. If you can do them all, we'll be all right. Just give me your best practice. Give me, tell me what practice you consider your best practice so that I know you've been there, you've already done that. We don't have to make up, you've got to row faster than you've ever rowed because the likelihood of you doing that is impossible. All you have to do is give me what you consider your best. Well, coach, remember that day we did 15 minute on, minute offs at 32? Everyone had clear spacing. You remember that practice? I go, yeah, I remember that. I said, the ones that guys fell out of the boat at the end, we did it right up here on this lake. And, uh, and they go, yeah, yeah. Because they all, the bow four had a plan that as soon as the piece was over, they would fall away from their oar and into the water. And the stern four knew that they had to let it run. And then after the guys cooled off, they jumped into the boat and the stern four did. It was all set up that way. I didn't know it, but that was all set up that way. And um, uh, I said, that's a great workout. Let's see if we could replicate that. And so they knew what they could do. And that, to me, relieves the tension. They, I said, that's all you need. You need that workout in this race. And they go, we can do that. We can at least do that because we've done it before. And they went ahead and they jumped Cal 
by the tip of the island, they already had a half a length. And by barrier, they had three quarters. And then Cal stopped, stopped it. No more, no more bleeding. And from the barrier all the way to the finish line, inch by inch by inch, here came Cal. Boom, 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 boom. And just at the progress board by the enclosure, we were taking our last little effort and we checked them. And we went across the line and we heard, Bip! that was it. It was just one beep. And everybody waited. I didn't even wait. So I never ride in the boat. I sit in the grandstand. And I, as soon as the race was over, I walked over. I was ready to congratulate Cal because I could see them coming. I could see them coming. I, could, I couldn't tell whether or not it, they got through us at the end. And they posted it on the board. They go three feet. And um, I went over. And the first crew I congratulated was the Cal crew. And they were all lying on the dock. And next to them was the Trinity crew. And I went to each guy and kind of hugged them and pulled them to me and everything. And I went to Ted Washburn, who was the paid assistant coach to, um, to the Cal freshman coach at that point. Steve had asked Ted to come in and help, um, help the Cal freshman coach. Um, I'm trying to remember his name. Jeff, Jeff Bond was the Cal fr Tough guy, rough guy. A lot of, a lot of um, Fs this and Fs that, okay? And I couldn't find it. I went over to Ted and Ted said, great race. Great race. You know, I know now why you didn't want to brush with us. I totally respect that. It was a wonderful race. And I thought, thanks, Ted. I appreciate that. And um, after the guys kind of got their boats away and we went to cool down in the, um, in the boat enclosure, uh, one of the Cal kids comes over to me and said, you know, no freshman has beaten this crew, but I know your foreman is a freshman. And I think the right thing to do is if we exchange shirts. And I said, that, I mean, all of, a kid coming over to say that, a freshman coming over to say that, to me was the highest, showed the highest respect for sportsmanship. And just, you know, Henley, you don't give up shirts. But he thought it would be a, a good ex expression of, of sportsmanship, of appreciation for the effort. I said, well, you know, there were, there were eight upperclassmen in that boat. He goes, that don't make any difference. We had our chance to win that race. But a f he was the first freshman to beat this crew. So I said, well, he's in the erg room. They went over. The two kids exchanged. I mean, the kids had unis at that point, you know. But they each were wearing a, a, a school shirt that represented a, over their uni or under their uni. I forget. But in any case... Um, they got to know each other, they shook hands, they talked about the race, the kid left. I step outside the boat tent at Henley, and there's Jeff Bond ripping the kid for giving up a cow shirt to a non-freshman crew. And he said, well, coach, this kid's a freshman. Well, you shouldn't have done it. Steve's going to hate that. And that night, I got on, on the email, and I wrote Steve. And I thought, I, I knew the kid's name, it escapes me now. So I thought that was wonderful, Steve. I said, it made such an impression on that athlete, on, on my athlete, Jordy, and my crew. We have the ultimate respect for that kid. I can't say the same for your coach. Okay, Wes Ng was my assistant at that time, and now Jeff Bond is the Penn varsity coach. 10 heavyweight varsity coach. So any case, um, we won that race, and then we get to face Andy's crew, who beat us by three quarters of a length on two, K, two times 2K, 10 days before the IRA. Andy Card? Andy Cards. And they, and they ended up winning the IRA. 
And um, so we are, we're, because Cal was the highest seed, for whatever reason, I never understood that. I thought Yale should be the highest seed. But Cal was the highest seed. It might have been because they won the IRA um, with a better time than the Yale Lightweights did. I don't know. I, I never understood why the Lightweights weren't the highest seed. But in any case, we took their place in the lane. So we drew Burks. Andy's crew draw, draws Bucks, and um, uh, we get off again to a great start. Uh, but Yale is right there. I'm mean, not a deck separating the crews at the barrier. And little by little, we move out, just, you know, just <clears throat> like that. And um, by Forley, we have a touch of open. Okay, and at that point, in their race plan, they were, after Fawley, right as they hit Fawley, they were supposed to take three tens, one for coach, one for our parents, and one for the crew. And the first ten got them to a length of open. And at that point, this is a kid who's been to Henley before as a coxswain, at that point, he nudges the middle a little bit. And I'm going, I can hear it, because you can hear the commentator who's sitting in the back of the boat goes, um, Trinity crew and the Yale crew are sort of sharing the middle. Uh, the referee has the flag up, and he's flagging both crews. He's going, Trinity, Yale, Trinity, Yale. And, and I said to Brack, Brack says, Coach, if we get any water, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to split it, split the, you know, split the course. I said, Brack, don't take a chance, you know? He said, as soon as he calls the flag up, I'll move over. I said, okay, if, if you can get it. I said, don't count on you even being in the lead with this Yale crew. Well, they get the lead. They get enough water that he can nudge it. And for some reason, the Yale coxswain, moves into the middle as well. I think maybe she thought that it would be better for, the, for the, the puddles from the Trinity crew to be between their puddles in the boat. I don't know what she was thinking. Any case, both crews get called, and Brack very gradually, over maybe 15 strokes, gets into his lane. And this girl, in like five strokes, so here you got this going on, and the margin looks greater than it actually is. And Brack then just turns this way, because he was a smart ass. He's now one, the, the uh, assistant director of the head of the Charles. He runs his own finance firm, special insurance company. But in any case, he just turns and goes, they're too tired to come back. And we end up winning by seven or eight seconds. And there's a famous picture that was in, row, in, in the rowing magazine about as the crew crosses the line and stops waiting for the Yale crew to come in, the two Graves brothers rowing bow and stroke stand up and salute each other and then sit down and then cheer Yale at that point, hip hip hooray, hip hip hooray, etc. And, and there's a picture of that, a mission accomplished. Um, and so that sort of stuff about being fair, about understanding what the commitment was, understanding the expectation, I think teaches athletes that they can do anything. Because by all rights, we shouldn't have beaten Yale. We, I mean, maybe we shouldn't have even beaten Cal because we had lost to Yale you know, literally four weeks earlier, twice by three quarters of a length. And for whatever happened, I always have felt that lightweights who go to Henley are tweeners. They were great as lightweights. They're not necessarily as good when they have to weigh 170 or 172 pounds. When they're at 155 to 160, they look like... When I took the crew down there, John, 
to, to raise Andy's screw. And Andy had more impact on the Trinity program when I was there than he ever realized. The fact that he recognized Trinity, and Andy was at Princeton the same time I was coaching there, but he gave us the boathouse. I mean, he, when we got to Yale, he would, he would have, he would order extra for lunch so that he could give the Trinity crew. He never said anything to me. He would just say, oh, we got extra food for, for lunch because all the meals were catered uh, when they were preparing to go to, to IRA. We got extra, and my guys don't eat that much anyway. So he always had lunch for us when we came down. It was, it was just very, very generous of him. And, and, and he would say, oh, you want to come and, and race the Housatonic next week? You know, he called me up. He said, oh, yeah, bring it down. I'll reserve, you know, how hard parking is. You have to go park across the river. He says, I'll just tell the buses to park on the street, not in the parking lot. We'll reserve you your Trinity spot. I mean, he just, he couldn't have been nicer. But that might not be Andy Card being nice to Trinity. It might be Andy Card welcoming Larry Gluckman. Well, I don't know that. It, it, could, it could have it gone back that way, okay? But, I mean... I, I owed him a lot, and he got a little bit, he was a little bit angry at me about, about the, this business on the course. And I said, Andy, let's be honest. The only time another crew can influence another crew is if you're open water ahead. I said, otherwise they're going to clash. Otherwise, that referee will disqualify that crew. But once the crews are a length of open... That's English rowing. There's a little bit of, you know, this is, the, you know, stiff up a lip. If, if you fall back, deal with the consequences. And he gave him two or three strokes, and then he flagged both crews. Are you still on good terms? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was mad, you know, for a few days, and, and he got, and then when we won, ended up winning, well, against his crew. Um, but that following fall, Come head of Housatonic the week before, I get a phone call. I haven't heard from you, Larry. I go, Andy, you know, we didn't exactly leave on the best snow. He goes, oh, that, that Henley crap. That was three months ago. Do you want a spot in the parking lot? I go, sure, I want a spot. Well, <laughs> just ask. I said, I need a spot. In the That's all I wanted to hear. I mean, you know, he was fine. He was fine. He, he, and then, and then, um, uh, Wes Ng, a Yale grad, who gave money for the crew to go to Henley, got on um, uh, a newsletter list. And, and he got a newsletter just having the, the Yale guys uh, show nothing but admiration for the Trinity guys, for that race. You know, I mean, they said... We rode hard as we could, and they were, on this day, they were better. We were surprised a little bit, but when you think about it, all in all, they were the better crew over the regatta, the length of the regatta. When you compare our times to theirs, when you compare how much they won pieces by versus us, you know, you could have predicted a closer race, uh, a close race, and yet we didn't measure up at the end. And there was just, there was no sour grapes, there was no nothing. It was just admiration for the two crews. You know? Nowadays, the YouTube does a really nice job, but your race probably isn't filmed. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. So in any case, that kind of process with the captain, with the selection of the crew, with the crew being able to name or to to pick their race plan, with the confidence growing within the crew. This is the way I did it almost every place I've been. Um, that, you know, I'm the coach, and, but, but you're the kids carrying the banner. You know, Harry's point in Symphony of Motion about, um, you know, is the coach the one that's competing or is it the athletes? And in the end, I'm as competitive as the next guy and I get pissed off. You know, if I feel that another coach or an official is doing something to harm my crew in any way, but in the end, the kids are on the end of the oar, and, and they know it. 
and they prepared and they either race it up to their ability or they don't, you know. And, uh, and I think my experiences along the way as an athlete made sure that as a coach, I provide my guys the most amount of exp um, the, the most amount of success with the greatest amount of clarity and openness, and and then the athlete takes over. And I, I think that's that's really important. And I've done it up here, and I do it where you know wherever I would go. So.